All right, with that, I call this planning commission, commission meeting to order on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022 at 6.01 p.m. I'll now read the COVID protocol notice. This meeting will be conducted pursuant to the provisions of government code section 54953 as amended by AB 361, which authorizes teleconference meetings under the Brown Act during certain proclaimed states of emergency. The governor of California proclaimed a state of emergency relative to COVID-19 on March 4, 2020. This teleconference meeting is necessary so that the town can conduct essential business and is permitted under government code 54953 in order to protect public health and the safety of, of attendees. And before I get to the roll call, I realize I was remiss in actually asking if one of you was comfortable with doing the pledge. And uh, Ben, if you are comfortable with it, I, I was hoping that you could do that. Sounds good. Okay, and now I'll you take a roll me? call. <laughs> Thank you. I saw your head nod. Yes. Uh, roll call vote. Um, uh, Vice Chair Lester. Here. Uh, Commissioner Bodie. Oh, not here yet. Commissioner uh, Helber. Here. Uh, Commissioner Polsky, I believe, is in an uh, excuse absence this evening. Uh, Commissioner Teal. Here. And I, Chair Hillis, am here. We are also joined by Town of Moraga staff. Uh, planning director Hamid. Uh, we also have assistant town attorney um, uh, Karen Murphy, uh, consultants Barry Miller, and uh, I. There's another voice uh, on that's running the meeting for us. Uh, Afshan, can you confirm who that is? Uh, Susie Susan Mele. Susie, uh, uh, good to put the uh, the name to the voice. Um, conflict of interest. Do any commissioners have a conflict of interest to report? Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, contact with the applicants. I do not believe we have any applicants this evening, so we can move forward. Uh, now to the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I will hold up my flag. Commissioner Helber, if you will do the honors. I'll put myself on mute so I don't throw you off. Oh, and we have one tonight. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. And now is the time for public comment. Uh, this time is reserved for those in the audience who wish to address the Planning Commission. The audience should be aware that the commission may not discuss details or vote on non-agenda items. Your concerns may be referred to staff or placed on a future agenda. Note, public input will also be taken on each item in the agenda uh, this evening. If there are any public comments at this time, please utilize the raise hand feature of the webinar and we will call on you. Remember to state your name and address for the record. You will have three minutes. Last I checked, we only had one attendee and I do not see that their hand is raised. Uh, going once, going twice, moving on, uh, closing the public comment. Uh, to adoption of the consent agenda. We do not have a consent agenda for this evening. Just double checking with Director Hamid that I'm correct on that. All right. Um, so now we move on to adoption of the meeting agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the meeting agenda? Motion to adopt. Motion from the vice chair. Do I have a second? Second from Commissioner Teal. Um, I'll do a roll call. Vice Chair Lester. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Bodie has not joined us yet. Commissioner Helber. Yes. Commissioner Teal. Yes. And I, Chair Hillis, am also an I. The, the motion passes unanimously. Now on to the public hearing. Uh, this is a public hearing regarding a discussion of proposed Moraga general plan amendments. Uh, I believe staff has a presentation for us this evening. Director Hamid, uh, did you have any remarks? Uh, and you may actually be the one that's providing the presentation. So thank you, uh, Chair Hillis. Um, we have our consultants tonight, Barry Miller with Barry Miller Consultants, and he will be doing the presentation tonight. We also have uh, support from our legal counsel, which is Karen Murphy. And I just wanna make some opening comments. Uh, so tonight's meeting is part of the Advanced Planning Initiative. And the Advanced Planning Initiative actually includes several components. Uh, includes the housing element, which is a requirement by state law to be updated every eight years. The rezoning of commercial infill areas to allow for multifamily housing. 
and I will get into that a little bit. Uh, the Bollinger Canyon rezoning, which has been a town council goal, uh, the environmental impact uh, report, uh, which is programmatic level and which is required as part of this housing element, general plan consistency amendments and the safety uh, element. Uh, so the housing element is required is a required update and the uh, in order to address the town's regional housing needs allocation of 1118 new units uh, that this requires the town to rezone uh, the commercial areas to accommodate the higher densities. This is already a vision that is incorporated in the 2002 adopted general plan. And under chapter four, under community design, CD 1.1, it does state to the extent possible to concentrate new developments in areas that are least sensitive in terms of environment and visual resources. And that includes the Moraga Center and the Ream Center areas. Um, over the last year, uh, the Planning Commission, Town Council, staff and residents um, have weighed in on the rezoning of these areas to allow for the new units. The town is not building the new units, uh, just rezoning to allow the units. So it doesn't mean that we will have a lot of construction activity uh, come January 31st. There's still a process that projects need to go through. So tonight is phase one of the general plan consistency amendments and the safety element. So we're focused on a certain component of this advanced planning initiative, and it will allow the town to enact on the policies that we have been discussing over the last year in order to respond to the state's requirement for uh, new housing units. So thank you, and I will let Barry Miller uh, share his presentation and walk us through the details. And Barry, before you get started, I just wanted sure. the, uh, the record to reflect that Commissioner Bodie joined us at 6.07. Um, and sorry to interrupt, I just want to be sure that was reflected. Uh, no problem at all. I just um, wanted to confirm everyone can hear me and see my screen on their screen. Yep. Great. Okay, so uh, we are here this evening to talk about the consistency amendments. As Afsha said, uh, this is really an informational presentation. We are not asking for commission action at this point. That is going to happen at a subsequent meeting. Um, as Afsha laid out, the comprehensive planning initiative includes the various components that uh, we've, we've just gone through. So without um, repeating everything on the screen, I will just point out that there are certain actions that need to be taken by January 31st, 2023 in order to comply with state law. And then there are a number of other actions that are, uh, I won't say they're not time sensitive because they are time sensitive, uh, but they don't need to meet that January 31 deadline. So we do anticipate uh, coming back to the commission in February and March to talk about the actual zoning standards and the objective design standards, uh, particularly for the Ream Center, but also there are a number of changes in the uh, Moraga Center area. And uh, those will be happening in early 2023 after we get the housing element adopted and the EIR certified. So we're here this evening to talk specifically about one component of the initiative. And these are the consistency amendments to the general plan. So just for some context, the general plan for Moraga was adopted 20 years ago in 2002 uh, after a three year process from 1999 to 2002. It's uh, under state law, you can amend the plan every four years, but the town of Moraga has amended far less frequently than that. Uh, the most recent amendments were in 2010 when the MCSP, the Moraga Center Specific Plan was adopted, 2015 when the last housing element was adopted, and then 2018 when the Hillside and Ridgeline amendments were adopted. There have been other um, minor amendments over the years, but those were the sort of the, the milestone amendments of the last decade, or a little over a decade. Uh, so the horizon year of a general plan is typically 20 years. So it is uh, an opportune time to kind of step back and revisit our plan. We have uh, changing state laws that require that we amend uh, certain parts of the plan. Some of the data in the existing plan starts to become a little bit stale when you see references to 
for example, the 1990 census, or you know, you anticipate uh, you're looking at a time when uh, the internet was still relatively new. And so you think about the, the way the world has changed in the last 20 years, and there's, uh, an, there's a, a necessity to update the plan. Uh, projections change, and we're sort of dealing with that right now as we look at this regional housing needs allocation that's much larger than what the 2002 plan anticipated. Uh, we also have um, new issues emerging, things like climate change and wildfire hazards that we're addressing in this plan, and uh, the requirement for internal consistency between the elements of the plan. So just as a refresher, the uh, general plan for Moraga has 11 chapters. Uh, most of these are referred to as elements, and um, a majority of those elements are mandated by state law. So every general plan in California has a land use element, a housing element, a circulation element, an open space element, a safety element. There's also a noise element requirement, and that is covered by open space. Uh, in Contra Costa County, all jurisdictions are required to have a growth management element. And then the Moraga General Plan has an action plan, which is really taking all of the policies in the general plan and summarizing how are these policies implemented in the day-to-day -day activities of the town. Then there are a series of appendices in the plan. So this is, again, the, the plan that was drafted 20 years ago that's guided the town for the last 20 years. So we are doing a plan update now, and I want to point out, as Afshad just, just mentioned, that it's a two-phase process. The first phase is adopting the new housing element, which we're required to do, and, create, and, and making changes to the plan to keep it internally consistent and uh, current with state law. The second phase of the plan, which is really intended to occur after we get our certified housing element, has a scope that's still to be determined, uh, but the idea is that we're not making radical changes to the, 20, to the 2002 plan. The values and vision of that plan remain relevant. We'll, we'll confirm that, uh, but there are, uh, there, this is an opportunity in phase two to uh, do some cleanup and update beyond what we're doing right now. And really I'll say what we're doing right now is fairly um, minimal just to keep the plan internally consistent. But that, that next phase will be an opportunity to look at each of the elements, uh, do a little bit of a deeper dive into topics like community design and open space and see, you know, can our plan uh, include new policies or initiatives on topics like sustainability, where we've heard from the community that the 2002 plan really didn't uh, dive deep. Uh, we do have an EIR that's being done as part of phase one and anticipate that we can use that EIR to address the phase two portion as well. Uh, there will be an addendum or a supplement to that EIR in the next phase, but the big land use changes, which is really the increase in density and the allowance for housing at the Ream Center are, um, are happening as part of phase one. So the amendments, we've tried to characterize these and identified five general categories. Uh, first are the pure consistency amendments. And I, I, by the way, have one slide for each of these topic areas. Uh, and then that's, that wraps the presentation. Uh, but we'll go through each of these. The housekeeping and cleanup amendments are really just, I would say, more clerical. The circulation and safety element are uh, to comply with state law. The Bollinger Canyon amendments are to carry out a longstanding council goal of uh, assigning a permanent general plan designation and land use and zoning designation to that study area. And then uh, there are certain amendments that are uh, included in the EIR for the general plan. So we'll talk about each of these briefly. Uh, so the consistency amendments are really, uh, you know, we're, we're making some changes through the housing element, increasing the allowable densities from 20 to 24 units per acre um, and allowing housing in the Ream Park, Ream Center uh, area. And the current general plan doesn't really reflect that. So we need to just go through the plan and find references to the maximum densities and make sure that they're consistent with what's being recommended by the housing element. We also want to make sure that there are no statements in the general plan that appear to contradict the direction where the housing element needs to go. And this is really a state mandated direction about making sure we're planning for a variety of housing types, 
that we're creating housing opportunities in all parts of the town. Uh, and there are certain statements, not many, but there are a few that say things like, only single family homes may be permitted in this area. So um, not anticipating major changes, but there are things like accessory dwelling units. We have SB9 and other things that are now basically saying, we really can't say that anymore. We have to allow for other housing types in our uh, residential areas. And then there are some a couple of changes to the land use element and general plan diagram. Uh, and as I mentioned, just making sure that our goals and our policies support this idea of planning for a diverse range of income groups. So the second category are changes to the general plan diagram. These are um, really focused in two areas. One is the assignment of, um, of land use designations to Bollin the Bollinger Canyon study area, which is this light purple area uh, at the right of the screen. And then we are also um, accommodating the higher densities. Interestingly, we don't actually have to make major changes to the map because the designations are in place. What we're really doing is adjusting the definitions of what's allowed in each of these colored areas on the map. Um, and right now, the general plan, oddly enough, does not have definitions of the land use categories. I will say this is the first general plan that I've seen in 35 years of doing this that has no definitions of what's permitted in these categories. So we are adding those definitions and defining the, the density ranges, making sure that the Moraga Center designation matches what's shown on this map, um, and then updating the Bollinger designations. We can come back to any of these slides after the presentation. So the, um, the housekeeping and cleanup amendments, this is really taking care of things where you're reading the document and you think, wow, that's really outdated. That's clearly something that was written 20 years ago. So when there's references to the Moraga Center specific plan as something to be done in the future, it was done 12 years ago. So we wanna make sure that the plan reads as a current document. Um, this includes an explanation of the comprehensive advanced planning initiative that's now underway. Um, there are some references to the state density bonus law with outdated information, so we're updating that. Uh, there are a lot of references to doing a specific plan for the Ream Park area, um, and the town is not going to be doing a Ream Park specific plan. We are actually creating the development standards and design standards now through this process, and uh, we'll be narrowing the focus of that to what we're calling a public realm plan, which really looks more at the street system, the circulation system, infrastructure, streetscape improvements, and how to make sure that that area is, uh, is coordinated and is uh, attractively developed in the future without getting into the zoning regulations that are usually included in a specific plan, because we're doing those now. So the circulation and safety element amendments, the circulation element, uh, we've met with the commission, I think it was in January of this year to talk about the shift to vehicle miles traveled. And this is a new metric for um, measuring transportation. So we are required under the California Environmental Quality Act to use VMT as the measure of when an impact is significant. This is really how much driving does a project induce versus how much congestion does a project induce uh, when it's approved. So we have new policies uh, related to VMT in the general plan. And um, I wanna point out that we're not eliminating the level of service standards that are in the general plan. We are simply complementing those with the VMT standards. Uh, the safety element under state law, we need to identify very high wildfire hazard severity areas uh, and uh, add a few new policies that are related to wildfire, recognizing those hazards and also recognizing the need to plan for evacuation. And um, there's an, an evacuation analysis that will follow during phase two of this process. That, so there'll be further, further amendments to the safety element in the future, but this is the initial step. Uh, we've actually met with the commission previously to talk through the Bollinger Canyon amendments. Uh, you've reviewed a previous draft of these amendments and they include eliminating a goal in the general plan that was uh, designating the 423 acres that you see 
uh, I highlighted here as a study area, and that area is also zoned study area. Um, there is also a implementation measure that goes into great detail about what would be required in Bollinger Canyon before anything can happen there in the future. So that language is largely being deleted and replaced with actual general plan land use designations. And the, this is what we uh, walked both the commission and the town council through earlier this year, the rural residential designation, which has a five acre per unit density standard is a new designation that's being added to the general plan through this um, these amendments. Uh, the area at the end of Joseph Drive will be designated one dwelling unit per acre, which is consistent with what's there now. And then the, um, the ranch property will, the, um, will be designated as uh, non-MOSO open space. And that is uh, consistent with its, uh, with the intended use of that property as it's conveyed to the John Muir Land Trust. Um, the, um, so, the, so the land use diagram is amended here and there are uh, new references to the rural residential designation added in the general plan since that's a new category. Uh, the last category of amendments is CEQA related. So there is uh, actually at your next, one of your next commission meetings, you'll be getting a report from our environmental consultant uh, walking through the EIR for the general plan uh, update, including the housing element and the rezoning and the Bollinger study area rezoning. Um, this EIR is anticipated to be, we're, we're actually planning on releasing it at the end of this week. So it's really just days away from being out for public review. And um, uh, this is sort of a sneak preview in that we're telling you here that it in indicates potential significant unavoidable impacts on certain topic areas. And there are mitigation measures that are recommended in the EIR to reduce those impacts. And um, many of those measures are to add certain policies and programs to the general plan so that future development complies with these measures and it becomes essentially self-mitigating um, by doing, for example, biological resource studies or geological studies and so forth. So that's uh, all contained in section N of chapter 11 of the general plan. So the action plan in, um, in the general plan has this new section, which includes about a dozen mitigation measures from the, um, from the EIR. Last slide just summarizes our next steps and we will be bringing this to the town council uh, in November. I'm not sure if that date is correct actually, because that would be next Tuesday. And I don't believe that, well, Afshan can correct me. I think that's actually 11-9, um, but we are gonna be coming back to the planning commission in January of 2023 with a resolution that asks you to approve or recommend approval to the council of these general plan consistency amendments. Uh, that'll be one of several resolutions that will be before you in January. Also, there'll be one to uh, for the zoning, sorry, for the, um, the housing element and the EIR and then the Bollinger zoning amendments to the town council. Uh, we anticipate they will be taking action at their um, January 25th meeting. And between now and then, I think I'm probably on almost every planning commission agenda because we have a lot still coming to you uh, between now and January, including inclusionary zoning, uh, the draft, the hearing on the draft EIR and updates on the housing element as we get our comment letter from HCD, which is due in about two weeks. So that concludes the presentation and I'm happy to answer questions and uh, take any feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do any of the commissioners have any questions? Good idea, good idea. Vice Chair? Okay. I might as well ask now. <laughs> it's not super related, except to say that Bollinger Canyon amendments um, I feel like I missed a chance to kind of look at this in some way. Is this like sort of settled and we're just moving forward with it, the Bollinger Canyon um, 
zoning and I feel like that went straight to town council and they had their way with it. They're done. Uh, yeah. yeah, through the chair, we did review the Bollinger Canyon uh, language and planning commission did make a recommendation to town council yeah. on the standards uh, for Bollinger Canyon and the rezoning. Um, and we held a meeting with council after the planning commission's recommendation. I think it was May. Yeah, it was May. Um, and so council also had an opportunity to review the, the draft standards and the draft ordinance language um, and clean it up some more. Uh, so we are proposing that that will come back uh, in January. Uh, I think we've, you know, had sufficient input. We've had community meetings. Okay. There, I, and I, my, my recollection, um, Commissioner Lester, is you may have been absent at that meeting because we, we had a robust discussion about the definition of agriculture yes. at that meeting. <laughs> That's my recollection. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Any other commissioners with questions? I did have a, um, several of my own um, and I did um, send these over to the planning director beforehand. Um, just question for you, um, just for protocol. Uh, so there were a couple typos that I, that I found um, would now be the appropriate time for me to mention those. Um, with my questions, or should I, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what my own rules for the meeting should be. Um, but I, so I think I'll stick with my questions and then I, and I'll, I'll just give you the quick list of what the, um, the three things that I found. Uh, first question, um, what specifically is the difference between a public realm plan and a specific plan? Uh, and the reason I'm getting at that is um, when we did the MCSP, we were able to actually have specific design guidelines that were only for the uh, the MCSP, I'm, uh, I'm, would we have that same opportunity for Ream? For example, I know we had some, some design comments specific to uh, architectural design and those types of things. Yeah, so um, we will be bringing to the commission zoning standards and objective development and design standards for the Ream Center I believe February, March is the time frame that we're looking at. We've actually drafted those at this point. So that that there's a corresponding component of the MCSP that has that content. And we basically have already created that for the Ream Center area. And we'll be bringing that to the commission um, as part of rezoning that area, we'll be including that. So what's left are the, the parts of the specific plan that aren't included in that effort are really, you know, what's the circulation system? What are the parking needs? What are the water sewer drainage needs? Uh, what kind of streetscape are we wanting? What are the public improvements that are needed to make this happen? That's what's in the public realm plan. So the development standards will already be adopted before the public realm plan is prepared. Got it. Um, the other question that I have is on page eight one, uh, the goal has been amended, but semi-rural has been dropped. Um, and I'm wondering um, why um, semi-rural was dropped from, uh, from the goal. Uh, yeah, let me just get to that page. And I, I think I looked at this one and the reason was, and it, by the way, we can add it back in. I, in this case, it's not, it would not, sorry, am I sharing my screen? Yes. Sure. Okay, yes, uh, forgive me for scrolling so quickly. So I wanna point out while you're scrolling, Barry, that that is part of the, uh, what we are now going to be calling the safety element. And right. what I also kind of wanna explain is when we have these goals, a lot of that character, community character is already discussed in uh, earlier chapters, like in community design and land use. So this is much more focused on hazards and mitigations, and it's more focused on, you know, those things that we would do for safety for the town as a whole. Um, so that's why I think we felt that uh, we wanted to make it broader um, 
rather than focusing on community design or uh, the character of the community. Yeah, and I would say it it would not uh, we can we can say a semi-rural community that effectively minimizes threats. I think that if that's the issue, that's not a problem. Um, the uh, I think the issue here is that to say that we would be a community that was free from hazards uh, is a little bit uh, ambitious when you have the hazards present and they are getting worse, if anything, in terms of things like wildfire. Uh, climate change, et cetera. So it's really how do we minimize threats? Uh, and the semi-rural really wasn't as germane to the sentence. So that's the reason that that came out. But I don't think it's a problem to add it back in. Yeah. And if I may just add one more thing, you know, when we're talking about the redevelopment of the infill commercial areas, I think that's where we would see maybe a different character. And we haven't defined that character quite yet. Um, but that's probably an opportunity for us to um, uh, maybe not put the cart before the horse. If I could, sure. through the chair. Oh, the real, same real quick, Commissioner. Going, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Commissioner Albert. Uh, com uh, com Vice Chair Lester at her hand raised first. Sorry. <laughs> really quick, that um, the removing of the semi rule struck me as well. Um, chair, and I thought, ah, but in uh, element two, values and guiding principles, it does clearly say that we value our attractive community environment in our semi-rural setting, and we take pride in our well-maintained homes, abundant landscaping, and high design standards. And then it goes through, and it does remove a couple notes of semi-rural setting, but I think that that sort of solidly set in there is still, for me, a guiding principle for Moraga. It just sort of doesn't need to be mentioned every time throughout. And so I was okay with that. I don't know if you are, but I just wanted to let you know that that was also there earlier. Thank you. And Commissioner Helber, I'm sorry about that. It was the exact same comment, you know, page <laughs> uh, two, one. And uh, <laughs> I know every time we're interviewed, I think we all say preserve semi-rural character. It's very important to the, uh, the purpose of the town. And I would be very reluctant to take it out of any of them, but maybe wordsmith it to make it fit. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, comments on this particular point? Uh, I'm sorry, I did have a list of them and I see uh, Commissioner Bodie. Yeah. Um, do we have a definition for um, what that actually stands for being semi-rural? Um, is there an official like description, like this is this is what semi-rural means because I hear I hear it so much, and it's kind of sacred. I mean, and and it's kind of sacred, right? I mean, based on what I hear, not from us, but it would just be helpful. I mean, I've been on planning commission now for over a year, and I, I still have never really figured out well, what does semi-rural mean as it pertains to Moraga, because I think it probably means a lot of different things to people in California versus people in Illinois versus people in Oklahoma? I don't think there is an official definition. I think it's a, really meant to be a value statement that it's not suburban, um, that there's something in between suburban and rural, and this is what that really is. Okay. Yeah, through the chair, we, we do not have a definition for what is semi-rural, and we do not have anything defined in our Moraga Municipal Code um, that lets us carry out um, what semi-rural is. I'm gonna add one more, Hi. Chair. Hi, Chair. <laughs> um, it's similar to that wild life interface. What was that? Wild land, urban? Wild land, urban interface. Thank you, wild land, urban interface. Um, where it's that landscape between town and country, it's that transition zone. And I think that not just the outskirts of our town, but actually our entire town is designated as that wild land urban interface. So that's semi rural mm -hmm. that's, still can see the hillsides. That's, that's <laughs> helpful. That's helpful. Yeah. Good. I can see cows from my backyard. I think that qualifies. Um, so. Uh, my my uh, next question is on um, page eight three, um, and it is S one dot one three. 
the text um, says to, um, that the, uh, let me actually go to that page, I go where, where it is. It says as defined by the uh, Moraga Municipal Code and Open Space Ordinance. And I'm just wondering if, uh, if, this, if it would be appropriate here for there to actually be a code reference so that a casual reader looking over this, or if there's a reason why we wouldn't put a code, code reference there. Yeah, through the chair, I, I would not recommend a specific code reference as you're aware, codes change over time. Um, Got it. So, you know, then, um, you know, there's always clerical errors. Um, so I think I would just leave it open. And then in the code itself, I would be more specific. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, I also had um, a general question because I noticed this um, in two different places. Um, one was on page 8-7 and another one was on uh, page 9.1. On, um, on 8-7, it says continue to uh, require review by the planning department and, and then on page 9.1, it says continue to seek um, I think it's regarding um, uh, government best practices. And I'm just wondering if there's a reason why we, it just seems to be extra words that are potentially unnecessary, um, where uh, in, sorry to split hairs here, but in, um, in S3.1, it could just strike, continue to, and be require review. Um, and then in, uh, let's see, FS1.1, uh, instead of continue to seek, it should say just seek. So seek improved. Is there a reason why we wouldn't do that? Or is it typical that you have um, that kind of language? I actually prefer to take out the words continue to, but what the feedback that I often get in preparing these plans is that if you don't put the words continue to, there's an implication that you haven't been doing that yet mm -hmm. and you're going to do that in the future and in these mm -hmm. cases these are things we're actively doing now so that's i think it's there's a little bit of uh well we're already doing that we should say continue to do that so that's it. it's just semantics thing it really is not substantive i think so it, it struck me when i read it as, as defensive but it sounds like that may be actually deliberately so so thank you that answers my question okay um, and uh, then let's see, and then the last one you already answered, this was regarding uh, the design guidelines. So um, those are all of my questions. And I think I'll actually put the, the other comments into, uh, on the typos into comments. Any other commissioners have questions um, before we move to public comment? All right, um, with that then I will open public comment. For anyone that has questions, please utilize the raise hand feature of this webinar and we will call on you. I'm not seeing any hands raised. So with that, we can move on, uh, close the public comment section and move to commissioner comments. Excuse me. Do any commissioners have any, uh, any comments? Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say this draft does a good job of cleaning up the language. Uh, in terms of just making it more flexible um, per the new elements that we talked about as a town and that we've agreed to to include under the housing element, um, such as increase in density and more mixed use options instead of just referring to single family residences. Um, it does so still keep it vague, which is good. Um, also, I think it did a good job of succinctly incorporating all of the new language that is needed to uh, get our general plan up to, up to date and in compliance with the state laws. So it didn't go above and beyond it was just nicely um you know added uh, where it needed to be um and no major new you know mandates or things that um we haven't discussed before nothing was surprising in here that i thought you know i'm always looking for the something getting snuck in there and nothing was snuck in there so i was happy to see that um so well done thank you thank you vice chair uh, any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Helber. Thank you. Um, I'll echo uh, Vice Chair Luster's comments. I think this was uh, does a great job in cleaning up uh, some of the uh, the files and uh, uh, different inconsistencies. I did notice um, 
where the Moraga Center used to be spe specific plan area, you know, as a defined term, and the Ream Park specific area is also a defined term. They're not always consistent, re consistently referred to. Sometimes it's just the Moraga plan. Sometimes it's just the Ream area. I think if we just do a find all, we'll probably find them and just make sure that where they're supposed to be capitalized to find terms they are. Um, that was just one house, uh, just cleanup item. Um, very glad Carrie and Brenda brought up the semi-rural. I had that done. And I apologize if this is a question I was supposed to ask it earlier. On section 8.8, .8, when we're talking about defensible space maintenance plan, we talk about requiring class A roof materials for new and replacement roofs. Does that apply to every single house in Moraga or is that only in certain areas for new subdivisions? I just wanna be careful of what we're, burden we're putting on somebody who needs to replace their roof. Are they gonna to have to go to a substantially higher, more expensive roof material? And I, Carrie, I apologize. I guess that is a question of staff. Yeah, that's something we're, we're, we will have to look into. I don't know if uh, my assumption is if it's stated that way that it would apply to the entire town. Okay. We will check with, uh, with, with the fire district on that. I think we should be cognizant of what mitigation we require to every house in Moraga. And we don't wanna unnecessarily burden someone who's doing a remodel with uh, expensive uh, requirements. Along that same line, my other comment or question has to do with the new comprehensive advanced planning initiative EIR mitigation measures that start on 1130. And I know we're going to have a separate presentation on them, but when I read through this, I was getting concerned again that a simple small residential project may suddenly be burdened with doing biological resource screenings for birds and resting bat or nesting bats and other mitigation measures that are very standard for large subdivision projects. And perhaps I'm not reading it correctly and it already is excluding those projects but I just thought it was worth talking about for a little bit. And Barry, if you could walk us, or me specifically, through when these mitigation measures would be required, it'd probably allevi hopefully alleviate my concern. Yeah, um, and uh, Director Hamid may want to weigh in on this and that. I will say we've been talking a lot about this very issue and expect we'll have a more extensive conversation about this at our next meeting where the EIR consultant will be present from uh, from Rincon because I think it would be good for the commission to provide feedback at that time. Um, I, the intent of these measures is not to apply to an individual single family house or a remodel. It's really meant for development projects that are um, you know more than more than just a few units or that are in areas that are undisturbed. So I think, we are looking at ways to communicate that better. Um, and there have been, even in the last couple of days, some edits to the, um, to the EIR, which will, you'll see when, it's, when it is um, published that, uh, that address what you just brought up. So I think we, we do need to clarify that. Okay. And Maybe we just threw in some terminology like the measures below may apply to future construction projects. That would at least give me some level of comfort. Um, and then on the cultural resource one specifically, where it's requiring construction monitoring as a required uh, measure, wouldn't we instead look at the resource study and the evaluation and if there's a potential for uh, a, font, a significant uh, resource, then we would require a specific construction monitoring and, and you know, paying for someone to be there during earth disturbing activities. It just seems like we're, 
the boil the boilerplate text is just too comprehensive. Yeah, we'll we'll have another look at that as well. Okay. Doesn't this say in or around a potentially significant cultural resource on that construction monitoring? I think it does. Specified by the Comprehensive Advanced Planning Initiative EIR. So there must be a definition in that EIR that we're just not seeing yet. Right. Um, of what that significant cultural resource. I know the monitoring of those sorts of things um, like Native American burial sites and stuff, that's super common. You know, having worked in Malibu, they are on that. Um, and I think it's defined as a specific area. You see one little thing and, and someone comes out. So I think we're gonna get a better definition of that already, but yeah. Yeah, we will. And then we'll check again before the draft EIR is released. Um, yeah. I understand what you're saying. You're meaning we don't need a cultural specialist on every project that we're building. That would Correct. not, that would be ridiculous. Correct. Yeah. I think what uh, Commissioner Helber is stating is that if we're doing infill areas, we want to try to encourage that as much as possible and to help streamline. So we want to not create onerous requirements um, and we want to help, um, you know, take a more uh, streamlined approach. Karen, did Very you well want to you. comment on that too? Thank you. I was just going to note that there are some limitations as noted by Vice Chair Luster in the text of the um, construction monitoring condition. So, for example, if there was development on an already developed site um, that would not involve um, ground disturbing activities and are around a potentially significant resource, then that monitoring would not be required. But again, um, I think we'll have more specific specificity in the EIR and we can also call this out um, with more detail as well to clarify. Thank you, I think that was a, a really good discussion and thank you for, for highlighting those areas. Looking forward to hearing um, the presentation on those mitigation measures later. Um, any other comments from commissioners, uh, either Commissioner Bodie or Commissioner Teal? No, I don't have any comments. Sam, thank you. Okay. Um, the um, I don't believe that we're being asked to actually make a motion. I think we're um, just receiving this item. Um, so with that said, I would just, I think um, uh, third, the recommendation or perhaps it was second the recommendation that we do add back semi-rural um, on, um, on chapter eight. Um, also on the, um, the, the very minor typos that I saw on um, the introduction section page, um, and I've already bungled up my packet here, so I'm just gonna read off my notes. Uh, the introduction section, page one seven, um, under consideration of amendments, uh, it should read at least one public hearing, um, and it reads um, hearings. Um, so it should be um, singular, not plural. Um, the second one is under values and guiding principles on page uh, 2-1. Under community design, it should read the town will maintain its predominantly. Um, there's an A, an errant A that also needs to be stricken. I just don't think it was included in the strikeout. Um, on action plan page 11-8, uh, where it says acceptable noise levels. Um, it reads a little bit jumbled, and I think that it's because unless needs to be removed, but I just wanted to highlight that sentence that it just needs to be a little bit more reworked. Thank you. Those are good um, comments. Thank you. And with that, I think we can close uh, the, the public hearing and move back to our agenda. Let's see where we are. So we are now on a routine and other matters. Um, we don't have anything here. Um, do staff or commissioners have anything they'd like to raise under routine or other matters? Uh, we can move on to reports. Uh, do any of the commissioners have anything to report? I would highlight that I do. So. Um, uh, was able to attend the uh, the developers roundtable last week. 
Thank you so much for staff for, for pulling that together. I thought it was very useful to hear the perspective of a, a really diverse array of um, folks. Um, just uh, I, if, uh, if, can you tell us whether or not the video of that is available for any commissioners that were unable to see that? Yes, it I was is. gonna um, comment on that in my report as well. Okay, well then I will not steal your thunder. Uh, thank you so much for pulling that together. It was, I felt it was really useful. In addition, uh, at, in case you all are interested at tomorrow's um, council meeting, uh, they will be, there is a special section where they will actually be interviewing um, a potential new colleague. Um, uh, we, I'm really happy to see that we have three applicants. Um, I know in the past it's been a little bit, uh, uh, you know, slimmer pickings once we got down to the, to the wire on whether or not we were actually even gonna have one. So it's really good to see that the community is engaging on this. So, uh, and with that, um, that's all I have to report. And unless the other commissioners have anything to report, I wanted to hand it over to Director Hamid. Afshan, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to give you some staff updates. Uh, we are still anticipating uh, written comments from HCD. What I'm hearing from other communities that have already gotten their comments, HCD is holding to that 90 days. So ours was submitted on August 12th. So I'm anticipating that we will receive ours either on November 12th or, uh, you know, it's also Veterans Day holiday. Um, so maybe November 10th, hopefully. Uh, and then we will bring those comments, uh, once we receive them, we'll bring those comments uh, to you. Uh, and while we're talking about HCD, um, we have gotten rapid and new information about the clarification for when the actual housing element is due. So I wanted to update you because there was a lot of questions coming in and not just from our town. Every city is actually uh, opining on this and going through this uh, because we thought we had a little bit of a buffer time. So HCD has provided clarification that we do not have any buffers. We absolutely have to submit our housing element, a compliant housing element by January 31st. So our goal is to um, bring all that information back to you um, and keep working uh, and uh, adopt the housing element at a regularly scheduled town council meeting on January 25th. Uh, I am making a presentation to town council tomorrow evening with all this new information and it has a new updated schedule as well. Uh, so if you want to, you can listen to that. Otherwise I'll probably share the report and the new schedule with you. Um, so uh, the developer round table that you asked about, thank you for attending uh, Commissioner Bodie, Commissioner Polsky and uh, Commis uh, Chair, Chair Hillis. Um, we also had two members of council attending uh, we had nine uh, developers uh, at that round table. Two of them were affordable housing developers, Eden Housing and Midpen Housing. We also had the two largest property owners there, uh, Jay Kerner with Reem Center and Dave Brazzoni with Moraga Center. We also had St. Mary's College, uh, which is a big part of this community. So I was really happy to see them uh, at that round table. Uh, the Roundtable uh, was videoed, uh, so we were just able to put that today on Make Moraga Home, um, and uh, you can it's basically on, on YouTube, so you can watch that. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to share with you? Um, as you heard through the presentation today, the draft EIR uh, is slated for release on October 27th, so that's this Thursday. Uh, and it will be open for a 45 day period where we take comments from the public. We will be bringing uh, the draft EIR to you at a special meeting. So November 7th is that special PC meeting. And because of elections on November 8th, uh, we are trying to be accommodating to Moraga residents um, and of course to our chair uh, and hold the meeting on November 7th instead, which is Monday at 6 p.m. And at that meeting, we will discuss the inclusionary housing ordinance, and we will also uh, discuss the draft uh, EIR, 
And if I hear anything from HCD, I will bring those comments to you as well. Uh, so that is the plan uh, for the next few days going forward. And that is all I have to share. Thank you, Director Hamid. And um, and I think I was remiss in also not uh, just thanking you and Barry for all of the excellent work you did in pulling together these um, these revisions to the general plan and everything you've been doing uh, to, 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 to repeat what I, I heard some of the members of the council saying to you at, a, at one of their last meetings, don't get sick. <laughs> we have a lot of work for you to do. Um, so thank thank you again. Uh, I really know that you're 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 really uh, you know burning the midnight oil. So uh, appreciate everything that you and, and your staff are doing. Um, and with that, uh, do I, we have an motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. A uh, second. A second. All in favor, say aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned at 6.57 p.m. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. Happy birthday to your wife. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>